why I am a Baptist is in these books and in the Bible. You know, nearly every person that started out on whatever religion they were raised in, when they got studying the Bible, it led them to the Baptist church. As we have studied here so many times in these classes, this is number 63. We vacillated back and forth from before until during and after the American Revolution. And now we've got John Madison, we've got uh, John Leland, the leader of Baptists, and we have these people talking about amendments to the Constitution. They ratified the Constitution because they thought if they didn't, the states would just break up. And then we would be victims of whatever came against us. Madison, uh, I'm just going to briefly read some of the things that he said. He said, we have uh, established this Constitution so that it will be uh, incorporated in the Constitution, will render it acceptable to the whole people of the United States as it had been found acceptable by the majority of them. It says here that the Constitution is the foundation of America and adopting the Constitution, it will inoculate them from the aristocracy and despotism of Europe. He said, any apprehensions that there may are those among its countrymen who wish to deprive them of the liberty for which they valiantly fought and honorably bled. And if there are amendments desired such as nature as will not injure the Constitution, they can be engrafted so as to give the satisfaction, the satisfaction of the doubting part of our fellow citizens, the friends of the federal government will evince the spirit of difference and concession for which they have been hereto distinguished. And the ratification of this system of government by 11 of the 13 states, in some cases unanimously, in others by large majorities, yet still there is a great number of our constituents who are dissatisfied with it, among whom are many respectable for their talents and patriotism, and responsible for the jealousy that they have for their liberty, which, though mistaken in its object, is laudable in its motive. I do concede that the Constitution may be amended, he said. And that is to say, if all powers of the general government may be guarded against in a more secure manner than it is now done, while no one advantage arises from the excess exercise of that power shall be damaged and endangered by it. We have in this way something to gain, and if we proceed with caution, nothing to lose. James Madison later to be President of the United States. And the advice of Madison was presented to George Washington. And the petition was prepared by John Leland and reads as follows, addressed to the Committee of the United States at the United Baptist Churches of Virginia assembled in the city of Richmond, August the 8th, 1789, to the President of the United States of America. Among the many shouts of that congregations that you receive from cities, societies, and states, and the whole world, we wish to take an active part in the universal chorus in expressing our great satisfaction in your appointment to the first office of the nation. When America, on a former occasion, was reduced to the necessity of appealing to arms to defend her natural and civil rights, Washington found fully adequate to be the exegesis and the dangerous contempt who by the philanthropy of his heart and the prudence of his head led forth her untutored troops into the field of battle and by the skillfulness of his hands baffled the, project, the projects of the insulting foe and pointed out the road to independence even at a time when the energy of the cabinet was not sufficient to bring it into action and the natural aid of the confederation. 
and from its respecting sources, the grand object was to obtain that the independence of the states acknowledged free from ambition, devoid of the thirst of blood, our hero returned with those he commanded and laid down the sword at the feet of those who gave it to him. Such an example to the world is new. Like other nations, we experience that it requires a great valor and wisdom to make an advantage of conquest as to gain one more conquest. He didn't do that. The want of efficiency in the confederation and the redundancy of laws and the partial administration of the states called aloud for a new arrangement of our systems. This is the Baptist preacher writing this now to the President of the United States. The wisdom of the states for that purpose was collected in a grand convention over which you, sir, had the honor to preside. A national government in all its parts was recommended as the only preservation of the Union which the plan of government is now in the actual operation. When the Constitution first made its appearance in Virginia, we as a society had unusual struggles of mind, fearing that the liberty of conscience dearer to us than our property of life was not sufficiently secured. Perhaps our jealousness were heightened by the usage we received in Virginia under the regal government, which mobs and fines and bonds and prisons were our frequent repast. Convinced, on the one hand, that without any effective national government, the states would fall into disunion, and all the Constitution evils, or all the consequent evils, and on the other hand, fearing that we would be accessory to some religious oppression, should by any one society in the Union predominate over the rest, amidst all these inquietness, inquietudes of mind and our consolation arose from the consideration, the plan must be good, for it has the signature of a tried, a trusted friend, if religious liberty is rather insecure in the Constitution, the administration will certainly prevent all op oppression from the Washington will provide. According to our wishes, the unanimous voice of the Union has called you, sir, from your beloved retreat to launch forth again into the faithless seas of human affairs to guide the helm of these states. May the divine manifests which covered your head in battle make you yet a greater blessing to your admiring country in a time of peace. Should the horrid evils that have been so pestiferous in Asia and Europe and, and faction, ambition, war, perfidy, fraud, and persecution for conscious sake ever approach the borders of our happy nation, may the name of the administration of our Lord beloved president be like the radiant source of day scattered all those dark clouds from the American hemisphere and while we still speak freely the language of our hearts we are satisfied that we express the sentiments of our brethren whom we represent the very name of Washington is music to our ears and although the great evil in the states is a want of mutual confidence between the rulers and the people, yet we have the utmost confidence in the President of the United States and is our fervent prayer to Almighty God that the federal government and the governments of the respective states without rivalship may cooperate together as to make the numerous people over which you preside the happiest nation on earth. And you, sir, the happiest man in seeing that the people whom, by the smiles of providence, you saved from vassalage by your valor and made wise by your maxims, setting securely under their own vines and fig trees, enjoying the perfection of human felicity. May God long preserve your life and health and blessing to the world in general, and the United States in particular, and when, like the sun, you have finished your course, 
of great and unparalleled services you go the way of all the earth. May the divine being, who will reward every man according to his works, grant to you this, sir, is the prayer of your happy admirers by the order of the committee, Samuel Harris Chair, Treasurer. Washington answered them to the General Committee representing the United States, the United Baptist Churches in Virginia. Gentlemen, I request that you will accept my be best acknowledgments for your congratulations on my appointment to the first office of the nation. The kind manner in which you mentioned my past conduct equally claims the expression of my gratitude. After we had, by the smiles of divine providence on our exertions, obtained the object for which we contended, I retired at the conclusion of the war with the idea that my country could have no further occasion for my services and with the intention of never again entering public life. But when the exegesis of my country seemed to require me once more to engage in public office, my honest conviction of duty superseded my former relationship or resolution and became my apology for deviating from the happy plan which I had adopted. If I could have entertained the slightest apprehension that the Constitution framed by the Convention, where I had the honor to preside, might possibly endanger the religious rights of any ecclesiastical society, certainly I would never have passed my, put, placed my signature upon it. And if I could now conceive that the general government might be so administered to do so, render the liberty of conscience insecure. I beg you that none will be persuaded and that none will be more zealous than myself to establish effective barriers against the honors or the horrors of the spiritual tyranny and every uh, species of religious persecution, for your doubtless remember I have often expressed my sentiments that any man conducting himself as a good citizen and being accountable to God alone for his religious opinion ought to be left alone and protected for worshiping the deity according to the dictates of his own mind and conscience. While I recollect with, with satisfaction that the religious society of which you are members throughout America uniformly and almost unanimously were the firm friends of civil liberty and the preserving promoters of our glorious revolution, I cannot hesitate to believe that they will be the faithful supporters of a free yet efficient general government. Under these pleasing expectations, I rejoice to assure you or assure them that they may rely upon my best wishes and endeavors to promote their prosperity. In the meantime, be assured, gentlemen, that I entertain a proper sense of your fervent supplications to God for my temporal and eternal happiness. I am, gentlemen, your most obedient servant, George Washington. One of the first things Madison pr proposed on entering the Constitution, or entering the Congress of July 8, 1789, was the following amendment to the Constitution. This is something that is gold, 24 karat. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people peacefully to assemble and petition the government for a redress and grievances. This is what happens in America. The last several years we have seen a great deluge of apprehension of the people in trust of their government. The majority of people in America today do not believe the government can be trusted anymore. And that's a shame. The only way for it to be trusted again is to redeem itself from the horrors that have been brought upon this nation. The Baptists felt secure under the new provision of the Constitution. Long after March 2, 1819, Madison wrote to Robert Walsh from 
Montpelier as follows. It was the universal opinion of the century preceding, the last, that civil government could not stand without the prop of religious establishment. This is the state and church, and that the Christian religion itself would perish if not supported by a legal provision for its clergy. The experience of Virginia conspicuously corroborates that this proof of both opinions. The civil government, through bereft of everything like an associated hierarchy, possess their requisites, requisites and stability and perform its function with complete success, while the number of the industry and the morality of the priesthood and the devotion of the people have been manifestly increased by the total separation of church and state. The total separation of church and state. The forces that work for liberty have thus been summed up by Bacon. In the establishment of the American principle of the non-interference of a state with religion, the equality on all religious commun communions before the law, which was due, no doubt, to the mutual jealousies of the sects, no one or two of which were strong enough to mandate the exceptional pretensions over the rest combined. Much also to be imputed to this differentiasm and sometimes anti-religious sentiment of an important and numerous class of doctrinaire politicians of which Jefferson may have taken as type. The chief honor of it must be given to the Baptist. Other sects, notably the Presbyterians, have been energetic and efficient in demanding their own liberties, but subjecting others' liberties to the whims of society. The Friends and Baptists agreed in demanding liberty of conscience. The Friends there are the Quakers, and worship and equality before the law for all the life. But the active labor in this cause is mainly done by the Baptist. It is their consistency and constancy in the warfare against the privileges of the powerful standing order of New England and of the morbid, the morbid establishments in the South that we are chiefly indebted to the final triumph in this country of that principle of the separation of church and state which is one of the largest contributions in the new world to civilization and the church universal. It's because of the Baptist and what they believe and what they believe the Bible to teach. America, like all the other nations of the world when it began, thought that mankind was so evil that unless he was made to go to church, that he was made to believe in God, that he would be so wicked that they could not rule him. And so they believed in state churches that were supported by the state and that taxes were taxed upon every being and that they took those taxes and paid the wages of pastors or priests or whatever you want to call them. When America, after the Constitution, they thought that every state ought to establish a church state to keep mankind in check. It's always been done that way all over the world since the Catholic Church. Catholicism was always, Catholicism began with the state and the church married into one by Constantine, 325 A.D. <clears throat> he furthered his empire by using it as using the Christian principles. Muhammad did the same thing, or the followers of Muhammad, in that the state and the church were inseparable. All down to the ages, Baptists stood for separation of church and state. That no way could a man be forced to serve his God. A man has to do that voluntarily, by his own conscience and mind. And when people are really converted, when they believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, when they ask God for forgiveness of sins, 
change takes place without mandating it. Without mandating it. Our Father, we send this little message out for your honor and glory that people might understand what your people fought for and what your son died for so many years ago. Father, as you said, as we go out into the world that we're to make disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe, to guard with their lives all things that you've handed down to us. Father, help us do those commands. Help us complete that request from you to us. Help us to understand the struggle that we've had through history with religious freedom and separation of church and state. In Jesus' name I pray. Please forgive me where I've